Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Health Animated. On this podcast, we strive to make health information accessible to everyone. My name is Alex. And I'm Danielle. And I'm Gordon. As you can tell, we have a very special guest today who is here to talk about diet culture, body image, weight inclusive care, and health at every size. So what do these topics all have in common? Well, it's all about diet. And who better to have than a dietitian? And so today we're very excited to have Gordon jump on our podcast. So Gordon is a dietitian and he is very passionate about evidence-based prevention-focused lifestyle medicine and nutrition care. Early into his career, he has experience working in the hospital setting as a clinical dietitian, providing nutrition care to adults and older adults in acute care settings, and recently he has been providing pediatric care. And Gordon has had a long history of volunteering and working for various organizations such as Summer Camps for Diabetes Canada. And Gordon is also very passionate about education and teaching, so recently he has pivoted to a full-time role working with students as a dietetics education coordinator. And of course, he is an amazing cook. So thank you so much, Gordon, for joining our podcast and welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure. So I just actually met Gordon a couple hours ago, and I can honestly say that I want you to be one of our best friends. One of my best friends. He's such a caring and like down to earth, genuine person. So I'm really excited to have this conversation with you today and for you to be educating us on these very important topics. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me. All right. So before we put you on the spot with all these diet related questions, we want you to tell us a little bit about yourself maybe perhaps your background, and what got you into dietetics in the first place. Sure. So my name is Gordon, as you mentioned, and I'm a registered dietitian. Uh, Dietitians are regulated health professionals who specialize in nutrition and food science um, and are healthcare professionals that are regulated just like pharmacists and nurses and doctors are. Uh, So we have very rigorous schooling and accreditation standards that we have to meet, as well as national competencies that we have to maintain. Um, and uh, we're registered with a regulatory body too, so we're accountable to the public. I became a dietitian because I love food and everything about food, and I always knew I wanted to help people and work in healthcare, so pursuing dietetics was really the perfect match for me. That's awesome. I mean, I mean, I talked about this in your intro already, but again, I just want to emphasize, Gordon is a serious cook. He is amazing, and I'm waiting for him to invite me for dinner again. Oh, absolutely, Alex. I know that you've put me on the spot now, but I was planning to invite you anyways. So with that being said, I think we should just launch into our questions. What do you think, Danielle? Yeah, I think so. Let's jump right in. So diet culture and body image, could you help to kind of paint the picture? So diet culture, like quote unquote diet culture has come up a lot on my newsfeed and social media lately. What is diet culture and why should we be so anti-diet culture, because I think that's also come up as well um, with in like equal frequency for me. So before I answer your question, I'm just going to preface that in the last, I'd say probably two years, I've been learning quite a bit about this as well. Um, it wasn't directly addressed in our schooling, but it is now, um, and especially being on the education side, I'm making sure of that as well. Um, so I'm, I'm still also on the beginning ends of my journey, so I have a lot to learn, but I'll hopefully share with your listeners uh, so they have a better understanding of what that means. So diet culture to me is sort of defined as like our society's obsession with a certain beauty or appearance standard and the normalization of restrictive eating or other problematic behaviors to achieve that standard of beauty. There is this imaginary scale which shows favor to those who look a certain way, typically thin or muscular or able-bodied, or whatever it may be that is idolized. At its core, the weight stigma that's related to diet culture and these unrealistic beauty standards, it's been, a long, it's been around for a long time. Um, people have been aware of that in the media outlets, but I feel like we've not really done much as a society to actually talk about why it's a problem and how we need to stop that 
and the impacts it has on everyone. So I think we need to be very aware of diet culture and how it comes in all of its forms because it's so pervasive to everyday life. And because I'm quite aware of it, I hear it all the time. I hear it just when I hear people on the street, when I'm on the bus, when I'm at a restaurant, when I'm at social gatherings, when I'm meeting new people, it's everywhere. So it's quite pervasive. There is definitely another side of it that we should probably be leery of with diet culture, because as you mentioned, then there's this other aspect that accompanies it, which is all of the, the negatives, like um, restrictive eating and whatnot. Do you feel like social media then has, has perpetuated diet culture? And do you think that it can also be maybe a tool to help deconstruct it or dismantle it? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting thought because I think with the advent and popularity of social media, it's really amplified both. So I think that as much as the problem has been perpetuated and brought more to the forefront and into more people's homes and awareness, also the awareness of diet culture and its problems has also been increased. So it's almost like they've neutrally both increased. And I don't know what that's going to look like in several years as the conversations continue to go. Um, I think that with more people realizing and, and, and sort of the message of, of being anti-diet and being more weight inclusive and health at every size, those, those concepts are being really praised because it resonates with people because it's finally a message that speaks to them and saying, hey, wait a minute, all, this, all these diet culture related messages are kind of problematic and oh I didn't even realize so I think I think it's going to gain traction or at least that's my hope um, with any sort of social Mm -hmm. social movement yeah and it's interesting too because like I feel like now just being more aware of how social media works how the more you kind of click on certain things the more that you're going to just keep seeing of that kind of stuff so I do it's interesting right because you kind of hope that you would see equally like things that are making you be more aware of like the negatives of diet culture but maybe you wouldn't necessarily see that unless you're following those types of influencers or those types of like posts so maybe maybe you really would only just see the diet um culture that are like you know pro diet culture um so yeah that's that's interesting i know recently i've started to listen to the iowa podcast It's just such a great podcast. If I'm sure there's probably a lot of you that have listened to it, like love Jamila Jamil as the host. She's excellent. But yeah, I think that really has kind of opened my eyes to all of these terms, like hearing them for the very first time and like trying to follow some of the the speakers that she has on as well. And it kind of just really helps to normalize every size, really just normalize that there's different body types and different body shapes and like, we are all here on this earth and we don't need to follow like Eurocentric forms of beauty and like be waif thin. Preach. I fully agree. You know, with any social movement, you can come to this point where you realize all the intersectionalities of all that thing, all of those uh, discriminatory identities uh, that are, you know, that people have against them, right? And I think it's really important that body size, um, body shape, and size diversity is not forgotten in that, that movement as well. Mm-hmm. I just want to pick up on, on the point about social media. Like, what I'm hearing is from you, Gordon, that, you know, social media is, is so pervasive these days in all aspects of life. Like, you know, we can't go more than one minute without being on our phone and, like, you know, getting our next hit of social media, whether it's through Instagram or TikTok. And I found that one of my personal challenges is like, how do I ensure that the information I'm getting from these influencers is reputable and that they are a credible source of information? So kind of like what you said about how social media is like, a, um, there's two sides of the coin with social media where you can amplify both the good voices and also the not so good voices. So do you have any advice for the general public or the general listener on how can they figure out like, whether this influencer or this person who claims to be like a nutritionist um, is actually credible. So do you have any advice for those people? 
Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a great question, Alex. And this is gets me excited because mm-hmm. it's actually just related to general science literacy, which I think is really important. And um, and we're not doing a great job in our our society of making sure everyone is more literate of how to reflect on and critically analyze and consume science information. So my advice for people would be, first of all, to say, or or to question, I should say, um, whether what they're saying is in line with a lot of other people. So if it's really contrary, you know, maybe there's a reason for that. If it's a new thought, that's okay. But if it's really contrary to a lot of other really reputable groups, like, I don't know, Canadian Medical Association, for example, or Dietitians of Canada, uh, that's that's definitely a flag to just you know, perk your ears up and, and sort of question it. The second point I would sort of encourage people to think about is who's giving the message and what is their personal incentive? So do they have a stake in it? Is there a conflict of interest? Are they selling a certain product or a certain service or way of being or doing something where they benefit directly from it? And sort of related to that is my third point is Who's being left out of the conversation? So if there's targeting a certain target group, say working middle class moms, are they forgetting about the single black trans moms or the indigenous folks? Um, So there's lots of questions to ask and just be aware of who's controlling the conversation. So I think it's really important for people to be very critically um, aware and asking these types of questions. Yeah. That was a very well put together response, Gordon. Thank you so much for that. I I think, um, I think you're right. Like in terms of thinking about some of the points you, you brought up, it's really important to kind of dig deeper and kind of understand, is there like a hidden agenda for this person and who are they speaking to? Right. Typically, you know, the three of us, we're all, we're all people of color and, I think sometimes we 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 tend to forget that all of this messaging really is sort of Eurocentric or West from a Westernized angle, and so um, it's really important to just dig a little bit deeper and kind of understand where where the source is coming from. And so, thank you so much for for sharing that. So, I don't know if like this is something that you might have the answer to right away, but. <laughs> I feel like our listeners are also curious about every time we talk about diet culture, you know, we can't help but think about diet and like you hear things about like keto diet or like um, intermittent fasting. Like if someone were to just jump on to the podcast right now and they want some quick tips, like can you quickly like tell us like what's actually what actually works or what actually doesn't work or is the whole di- idea of diet just should some should be something we should just dismantle completely from a vocabulary because my understanding of diet is to me it's always like a temporary thing to get you to this short-term goal and so help me to understand all of this so the reason i love your question alex is because i'm going to do that thing where i'm going <laughs> to answer your question with my own questions how dare you <laughs> <laughs> just kidding i love it <laughs> because there's so much nuance in that question like what what does it mean when someone says quote unquote did that diet work so it work in what way what's the goal here and to what extent do we stop that goal we know that a lot of research well i should start with we know that a lot of people go on diets typically to lose weight or to change their body size typically to become smaller in some cases it's to become bigger or you know get the gains or put on muscle etc but either way it's to it's to modify how their body and shape looks so they're changing their eating habits and as you mentioned for a short term so at what point then does do you remove the stimulus which is the diet the change in the diet and then the effect is gone so in essence is that diet actually successful because now you've lost it you've lost the effect once you stop the stimulus so at what end point would you say that when someone goes on a restrictive diet to lose weight, you know, one year out from now, they're, they're still at that same weight. So is that successful? But then when you look at them five years from now, what if they've regained all that weight or they've gained more weight? Can you still say that diet was successful? Wow. <laughs> I mean, initially, 
my gut reaction is, oh, of course Gordon would answer my question on top of another question. Um, but, you know, I totally get it because when I think back to my question, I feel like it comes with so much bias and a lot of assumptions. And in a way, I feel like that's sort of how I've been oriented growing up. Like immediately when you talk about what is the end goal, I can confidently tell you, and I think this is something I should probably change in my practice, is that when I have patients coming in who like has like type 2 diabetes or whatnot, and one of their goals is to like lose weight, when we talk about like monitoring plan for like the drug or their medical condition, oftentimes we use losing weight as a parameter for measuring success. So we'll ask the patient, you know, how much, how many pounds would you like to lose or what is your ideal body weight? And then they'll say like, oh, I want to lose like, you know, five to 10 kilograms. And I feel like (laughs) maybe like over a couple of months, but anyways, and I feel like as a pharmacist or even as a you know, a non dietitian I feel like we almost validate that type of goal. And I feel like in a way, it's not very helpful because like you said, it's probably just a short term goal. And I think the key is like, it's endurance. Like how do we, how do we get them to, I guess, make good changes in their diet such that it's habitual and it's something that they can sustain long term. So am I kind of getting it? Am I getting closer to the answer? <laughs> yeah, you brought up so many points in that in that uh, comment, Alex. I, I want to make sure I touch on as many of them as I can. The first is that you mentioned that the medical system tends to perpetuate weight stigma and this idolization of weight loss as a medical intervention. And that's something that I tend to pull into question. It's not that I don't think that people who are in larger bodies don't have health problems. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that people who are in larger bodies, they tend to think because that's what the media tells them, what our society tells them, what their healthcare providers tell them, is that your problems will go away once you lose weight, which is not always the case. We actually know that a lot of people who have those same conditions can be in thinner bodies and still have diabetes, still have cardiovascular disease still have depression so then why are we saying for the people who are fat you need to lose weight to improve your depression is that really equitable it's kind of discriminatory and that's exactly what weight stigma is you know we we can acknowledge that in the medical field especially we have quite a bit of weight bias and weight stigma where we treat people with larger bodies differently so it's not actually fair for them and of course, they take that message to heart because we're their healthcare providers. So they think, oh, you know, if I just lose that extra 5%, according to Diabetes Canada Clinical Practice Guidelines, that my blood sugars will improve. But really, when you look at the interventions, why aren't we focusing on, ah, how did they actually lose that weight? It's because they started walking every day. It's because they started to eat foods with more fiber and more balance. They had protein and, and vegetables. Uh, They started sleeping more. They stopped smoking. They drank less alcohol. Those are behaviors that they've modified. It may or may not have even changed their weight at all, but it can improve their their blood pressure, their blood sugars, their depression, their mood, like their mood mood will improve. So that's something that I definitely try to empower my patients with and my clients and, and tell everyone who has an ear to listen and ha- is open to is that we we sort of idolize um, and put on this pedestal weight loss as this cure-all for all of these health conditions and problems when really we could be looking at so many other things that maybe science hasn't even been able to confirm but for the most part they're the simple things that we kind of all really know already in our gut you kind of just blew my mind there for a second because with the whole reframing of everything like you know it's it's not just about the weight it's about what are the interventions like what is the root cause of the weight and it's funny because like I feel like in science we're always taught to question you know correlation not causation right but then immediately we're like oh it's weight loss but the weight loss is attributed to so many other factors and how do we just blindly just say oh yeah but and I think also you're right it would be a lot easier if you told somebody hey just go out there and eat more broccoli 
and eat more of this. And like as a New Year's resolution, because thinking back, because we actually looked at like the behavior modification for New Year's resolutions in our earlier episodes, I'm like, it would be so much easier just to say, hey, I'm going to eat broccoli once a day or three times a day, or I'm going to have this many servings of vegetables versus like saying, I'm going to lose, you know, eat healthy and like lose five pounds or whatever. Yeah, it, Danielle, you totally reminded me of that one episode about the New Year's resolution where we talked about habit formation. And we learned that creating a new habit, such as, like you said, eating broccoli is a more achievable goal than an avoidance goal, such as I'm going to avoid eating chips or I'm going to avoid eating cake. So with that being said, Gordon, do you feel, do you like, do you agree with that? And how do you support um, your patients or clients and in those that want to address their diet and losing weight? Yeah, I definitely believe that psychology is one of the biggest factors in dietary choice. Um, that's something that I did learn in school, thankfully. Um, but uh, obviously, there's lots to always learn, and, and you can delve more into that. And I do a lot of counseling and, and with my, my patients and clients. And something that I often discuss with them is that, similar to your discussion of the habits, is that restriction tends to lead to binging. When there's an absence of this feeling of deprivation, people actually tend to not want that thing that they've been told is forbidden as as strongly. Like think about when when someone says you can't do something, that's all you can think about. So it, it tends to actually become the object. So I really like talking about affirmative habit building, such as what you described. So I want to aim to, you know, take the stairs instead of the elevator every day. That's a achievable, positive oriented goal. And that's a, a really achievable thing for a lot of people compared to saying, I'm going to stop eating carbs. Oh, that sounds terrible. Yeah. I love carbs. I follow an account on Instagram called Noodle Worship. Noodle Worship? <laughs> yes. Let me guess. It's all posts about noodles. Yeah. So many noodles. Oh my God. A lot of pasta. I, I, so, I mean, this is such a side topic, but like I discovered that I can't go without rice. Like, I love rice so much. And I didn't realize that until, like, I've had periods where I didn't eat rice. And it's just one of those things where, like, I grew up with rice. So if you were to tell me to cut it out, because I know it's, like, you know, it's it's a, it's a very, it's very carb-heavy. Yeah, so, like, white rice glycemic index is high, which means it releases quickly. The sugars enter your bloodstream quickly and creates a, a spike. Um, so I, I know that, but it's just so hard for me to like, if someone were to tell me to stop doing it, it would just be like impossible. And it kind of goes to what you just said about, you know, we need to explore um, the reasons behind the weight gain in the first place. And we can't just look at the individual level, but we have to contextualize it, looking at culture, society, and everything else, because all of that needs to be analyzed in order to fully support the patient, right? Because if the patient eats rice every day, it's probably not realistic to tell them to quit eating rice, right? It's just going to be something that they're going to crave more, right? And eventually lead to binging, potentially, as, as you just mentioned, Gordon. Absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up. And that's something that I always really strive for as a dietitian is tailoring nutrition recommendations to that individual according to what's important to them and their values, their culture, and what their goals are. You might scroll through social media and find very blanket nutrition recommendations that are quite restrictive. Things like cut out carbs or stop eating rice or bread or pasta. FYI, I love carbohydrates and I think that it's such an easy vilified scapegoat in nutrition, but that's a whole other topic. Um, And I'll say that a lot of these blanket recommendations are also quite discriminatory from a inclusive culture standpoint. It really ignores a ton of historical data of, for example, like I come from an Asian background, white rice has been around for generations. But when has the quote unquote 
obesity problem or overweight problem become an issue it's actually really only been when the globalization of the world and the change of all of our lifestyles with technology with advancements in food production and distribution and you know changes in how much physical activity we do um, the rise in depression and anxiety substance use there's so many other changes that could be attributed to to changes in body shape and size even if that isn't a problem in the first place so i think that it's hmm, quite discriminatory quite racist when people give very blanket recommendations without considering the individual Mm -hmm. yeah i totally totally agree with that i'm just like so so amazed at how eloquent you are gordon Um, (laughs) thank you we love you so much yeah and like I'm, I'm just, um, yeah, I just love that. It's funny because when we were first designing these questions, we didn't expect to go beyond the layer of like food and diet. But to me, it's starting to become this realization that really you can't just look at diet in isolation. It's about all the other things you've talked about, the culture, the, um, the looking at the historical data, how our ancestors used to eat, you know, and, and 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 to present time where you know globalization food distribution access to food like all of that they all play such a big role in this conversation about about diet and then like speaking about conversation you know we you know we would be remiss if we didn't talk about vocabulary and language right because that's that goes hand in hand so we obviously know that language is important you know to me i view language as a form of technology because that's how we communicate with each other and I think, you know, for myself and I'm sure for Danielle as well, like we're both learning to be better to support body positivity. In your opinion, what are some common phrases that you hear that really people should try to avoid saying um, or that you should feel more comfortable saying? Hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. Very practical. The first thing that comes to mind for me is it really tends to bother me when people comment on other people's bodies unsolicitedly. So you might see a friend you haven't seen in a long time. You're like, oh, wow, you look great. Did you lose weight? Or wow, oh my goodness, you, you've slimmed down. First of all, it's unsolicited comment about someone's body who may have actually lost that weight because they have an eating disorder or because they are in a wild depression state right now, or because they're mourning a trauma because they lost the family member. So why are you saying that they are looking so great just because of what you see visually? And, you know, we really shouldn't be commenting on other people's bodies at all. It's their business. It's none of our business to comment on their body unless they ask us to. So for me, permission is key. I try to avoid talking about other people's bodies without their consent. Uh, and that's something that I hope one day will be more commonplace as well, because it, it really is basing someone on their looks and it's judging a book by its cover without knowing the full story. It's making so many assumptions that can actually be quite triggering and harmful. The other thing I'll mention is, I think we need to to use the phrasing that people who are in larger bodies or who are fat want to use. I think we should look to them because I will admit I am a able-bodied thin dietitian. So I have a certain bias and privilege that I don't have the right to use and coin or, you know, sort of dictate the conversation and how it goes. There's a lot of fat activists out there who are, you know, reclaiming the word fat and not making it a derogatory term anymore. So in those cases, using fat to describe themselves is actually a very positive thing because they're just describing how their body is versus in a negative tone. So I think that's something that um, people need to start to, to listen more to is the fat activists and what they want to use as terms. And then in general, I think everyone just needs to stop commenting on other people's bodies. It's not their business as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, everything you say totally resonates with me. Um, like growing up Asian, I just feel like whenever I attend those large family gatherings, 
One of the first comments that I usually hear from people is either, oh my god, you got bigger, or oh my god, you got skinnier. It's never like nothing. They Like the aunts and uncles, they have to comment on something. Mm-hmm. And I feel like, you know, because I am male, I feel like it's afforded me uh, a bit more privilege compared to, you know, say my female cousins or my sister. Because I know for a fact that, um, you know, who, who wants to be commented on? about their weight right especially if it's like oh you got skinnier or you got fatter right so i think growing up that's something i i i definitely found annoying (laughs) in the family gatherings i love my family for the record and then the other thing that i really want to ask you is because i encountered this myself is that okay now that we're in now that we're like into the summer season i hear a lot of people going like oh i'm gonna like get that hot girl summer and like or like oh i'm so fat like i just want to lose some abdominal fat right and so when i hear my friends saying like you know they tell me explicitly that they want to lose weight sometimes i don't know how to respond to them because i don't want to be like oh yeah like i agree like you should lose weight right because i feel like obviously that's offensive right but i guess what i'm trying to ask is like if people kind of open up the conversation and they comment about their body and they say they want to change an aspect of their body say like they want to lose weight for the summer as a friend like what can i say in response to them or should i just simply like ignore it i'm so glad you asked that question alex the first thing that came to my mind was that first it depends on your relationship with that person and how well you know that person um and asking them for permission to discuss so for me, consent is huge. Consent culture is huge, and especially in healthcare or anything related to, to health and wellness. So if you have the type of relationship with your friend where you guys have these difficult or maybe uncomfortable conversations, maybe it's actually okay for you to ask your friend, hey, what do you mean by that? Or tell me more. What do you mean you want to lose weight? Or why is that? Um, and maybe they're actually open up and talk about, you know, feeling uncomfortable in their bathing suit or going to the pool because people will judge them um i find that a a lot of times you know it's it's our it's our society that judges people but people judge themselves too and they have this perception that everyone's looking at them or everyone thinks poorly of them when people might not actually notice until they actually bring it up and say oh i've gained so much weight and be like oh i didn't even notice but now that you've brought attention to it okay i notice so (laughs) So really, I think that there's, you know, from an individual level, from a societal level, there's too much emphasis on body shape and size. Um, and then why, why is that so important? Like if you had a bit of extra fat on your body, why is that preventing you from going to the pool and having fun and enjoying your, your best life? Why should that stop you? It's, it's just a, it's a very philosophical question. Mm-hmm lack of self-confidence at least well (laughs) yeah I think it's just because every single day since we were probably toddlers we've been indoctrinated to just to like what is the the beauty standard right and it's so I think it is so hard to escape from that and I think it's been ingrained into yeah and I think even consuming like um you know, I think positive influences, like, you know, listening to the IY podcast, like trying to follow people that are like health at every size advocates. But it's really hard because you always are trying to reconcile with just your, I guess, brainwashing from like a young age of like, what is the, the ideal image and like, what's the ideal body type? I think it's, it's really, it's tough, right? And I think that it's hard when like you you know you want to be the enlightened one in the room but when social norms are just totally fighting against it it makes it really hard absolutely and i fully want to acknowledge that too i never blame people for wanting to lose weight because who doesn't want to be seen as beautiful or attractive who doesn't want to be treated equally who doesn't want the same access to healthcare and services without discrimination? Those are all good things that people should get. And I really liken this movement in the weight inclusive movement uh, and the health, health at every size movement very similar to this racial awakening that we've been having in the last year and a half in that we're just seeing the symptoms of 
the problem. The people themselves who are exhibiting the thinking and behaviors, they've just been groomed. They're just experiencing the symptoms of the greater system of problems and discrimination and stigma and bias. So it's not really their fault that they want to lose weight because they've been socialized to want to lose weight. So I think it's okay. And it, yeah, sometimes when people bring that up to me, it's pretty uncomfortable. But um, for me, I, I always bring it back to myself because they can never question what I think about myself. So I use a lot of I statements. Um, and, and I'm assertive with it. And I just say, for me, I'm not going to let how my body looks prevent me from doing that fun activity or eating those delicious cupcakes or whatever it is. So for me, what I do is I, you know, ask curious questions about them if they're open to it. And I have that type of relationship with them. I give them an opportunity to hear what I do to reframe those phrases. And I give gentle reminders as well. Gordon, I th- what you said was really beautiful about starting sentences with I statements because I think it brings power back to the individual and yeah like our our mind is is can be so powerful and at the same time it can be also very manipulative on ourselves as well so to that end like how would you like like how do you encourage body acceptance from yourself because like you said earlier sometimes the biggest barrier is ourselves because we have all these internalized ideas of what the perfect body should look like as dictated by society. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'll be the first to admit that I'm also always on my own journey of learning and unlearning for myself as well. I also have been groomed to think that there's an ideal body and to look a certain way, to be attractive, etc. So what I would encourage people to do um, is something that I'm, what I'm doing is, is doing the work, is critically thinking and analyzing and questioning, similar to if you're willing to do the work on, you know, equity, diversity, and inclusion from, for example, and anti-racism. Um, you need to stop and think and reflect. And what's important to you? What's, what are your values? What are your ethics? And then consciously try to reframe all those thoughts and maybe you need to talk it out with some friends or trusted people in your circle or a therapist i have a therapist i meet with regularly i think all healthcare providers who provide care and uh health to other people need a therapist i'm the number one proponent of that because we need to decrease stigma in all aspects like mental health care too you know even if you're not quote unquote depressed maybe you just need a space to talk it out with someone who's in your court who's a professional and trained in that so you know you might seek out a dietitian who's weight inclusive or a counselor who's weight inclusive to to start having these questions or start unpacking these questions that you might have and there's tons of resources online too that you can look up to such as podcasts like the i weigh podcast that danielle mentioned or some blogs out there and yeah there's just lots of more conversations happening which i think is such a positive thing love having this conversation right now and thank you for being so vulnerable as well and in, in sharing sort of openly saying that you are also going through this personal journey and you are still learning a lot of these things yourself as a dietitian because i think it brings a lot of comfort to me especially as a non-dietitian and also to other listeners that hey like even though we have you know dietitians that we look up to they are still learning and developing the vocabulary and understanding current trends in in health and in weight so so thank you so much for that and i think it's it's also so reassuring to hear from you that it's not just about having a dietitian to support your health journey but it is also about under taking care of your mental health as well because you know if i'm hearing you correctly mental health has a plays a big role in helping someone manage their weight so i really appreciate you talking about you know perhaps you might want to expand your circle of care to not just a dietitian who is weight positive but also perhaps a counselor or a therapist and like you said you don't need to be clinically diagnosed with depression to see a therapist we all know that prevention sometimes is the best medicine and it's the key to to success so i just want to say like personally like thank you so much for sharing that because i think it means a lot to some of our listeners out there 
Yeah, I totally agree. I think we're going to say a lot of thank yous in this time. Um, we love you. <laughs> yeah. So I do kind of want to touch on the fact that like um, what you mentioned, which is just that our education and like our language really helps to kind of shape some of these things. So I kind of reflect back to my own learning and my own like education on all of this, even through like pharmacy school. And I also think like my like training and orientation in this realm was very much focused. I guess it must have been on the old school way of just, you know, looking at like weight loss and like looking at it in a very like one dimensional lens, like not mm -hmm. the multifaceted complex lens that it is. And it is, it's such a complex topic. Yeah. It's, if I can quickly interrupt, like I agree, like I think the way our education supported us is, is that we looked at weight, weight loss very linearly. Mm -hmm. Like it's about where you are in point A and how do we get you to point B. And I think as a profession, I think we're really obsessive with like measurable outcomes. Mm -hmm. And like when we see a decrease in number, we're like so happy. We're like, yay, like mm -hmm. our client has achieved their goal, right? So mm -hmm. I totally agree that this conversation has just reignited sort of the idea that um, there's so much complexity with managing weight and it's not just about going from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And even just to have, like just to even change the approach when ha with how you ask things too, because I mean, as a pharmacist, like when I was working clinical, like, I, you know, you would often have to ask those questions, like, you know, how much do you weigh? During my um, training for clinical practice, like we did, you know, learn, make sure you preface like the reason why you're asking like for weight. Yeah, preface. as a part of medication dosing, because I think everybody can appreciate like the need for it in that respect. But I think just in, in general, probably other healthcare providers maybe need to have a better reason for asking for it. I think probably... I mean, at the end of the day, I will say to everybody out there, when healthcare providers at the hospital ask for your weight, it will go, it'll go into the chart and we will use it for medication dosing. So it is a really kind of important element um, for your healthcare records. So just know that we are asking for a good reason, even though we're not always providing that rationale because, you know, we're all still learning as healthcare providers. Um, and I would also extend that to community outpatient practice as well, right? So if your community pharmacist asks for your weight, right? And you're on an antibiotic, right? Usually the reason is because we want to check dosing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think there's a lot of legitimate reasons to need to monitor weight. And weight is just so easily measurable. So it could be something that they like to, to latch on to because you can easily measure it and monitor it versus like asking about how many vegetables they're eating or how their sleep is going that takes more work and more time to sort of really investigate and get that fuller picture for that assessment um some of the examples that i can think of where weight is really a useful marker is i work in pediatrics and that's something that's really important to monitor growth right there's milestones that they have to meet and certain developmental goals and so weight is actually really crucial but then you kind of think of it and say, well, if they're having problems eating or they're constipated or they're not having good sleeps or whatever other problem there may be, does weight always need to be measured? So there's there's always a, a question of does this actually need to be measured or not? Um, the other part, because I used to work in diabetes quite a bit and I have my diabetes certification is um, with interventions with diabetes a lot of them do focus on weight loss for improvement in blood sugar management but i would challenge that and say that a lot of times the interventions that i do with my patients i didn't even need to know what their weight was you know talking about improving their dietary quality their stress management or their sleep you don't even need to, need to know their weight to talk, talk about those things but i 100 percent agree that pharmacists need weight for medication dosing and dietitians need it for tube feed recommendations and IV feeding and all that. So there's certainly merit to some times when you do need to measure weight. But again, I agree with what Danielle was saying earlier that you should really be explaining as a healthcare provider why. And just so the, the, the patients and clients know right, and are fully aware. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about something that um, 
See, I just learned recently about, which is BMI. So, okay, obviously I know about BMI. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so, uh, but I learned, I, I um, let me, let me backtrack. <laughs> so I learned the history about BMI. So, like, so in pharmacy school, BMI, we learned about this for, with respect to like, you know, dosing weight and like stratifying patients into various categories based on their BMI. And a lot of the studies as well are what they look at it as, as a stratification marker for what group they're going to put people in and how they're going to measure things. So BMI has now been tied to a lot of these studies and like what the BMI is will help you to kind of get a, get a quick idea on whether or not this drug dosing will be effective at, at the stratified levels of BMI. However, I just learned that BMI was developed about 200 years ago by a mathematician, not a physician, and it was primarily done on white European men, and that it ignored a lot of other things, which is like our physiology, you know, that bone is denser than muscle that, um, and, uh, you know, muscles denser than fat and like waist size. It just ignored a lot of different physiological markers. So I now question why, but now we've kind of done this thing where we've tied this thing that was really not very scientifically grounded and we've like embedded it into our scientific literature and research and like why and like, can you to help me to understand how can we look at BMI the same or do we need to look at it differently? What can we do about this? I love that comment, Danielle, because therein lies our problem with medical care and research and how it's come about in its current state. It's not without bias. And that's something that we really need to be aware of as a society and as clinicians and scientists and healthcare providers is we do have the scientific method, but the scientific method is only as good as the unbiased researchers who are designing that research study. So with the original studies that developed BMI, it's a great point that you made that they were actually only studying, you know, white men who are healthy and thin um, and all of the parameters that they saw as quote unquote, the ideal human. So it really excludes, excludes a lot of racialized people, people of different body shape and size or different genetics i think fat really is the future frontier but not as easily measured of course as like a simple weight check so i think there's a lot of changes that are going to happen in science but it does take a lot of awareness first of all in the medical field and research for those people to then design those studies that can then create parameters perhaps that will be more valid than bmi um, right now though it is quote unquote, very useful because it is very easy to check. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, for example, in medication dosing or in pediatrics for growth, it's one of the primary indicators to monitor growth. Um, so it's, it's not without its uses, but there's certainly tons and tons of drawbacks. Um, if I don't, if for example, if I'm seeing um, a kid who's a sick or has a chronic disease and I don't actually for example with COVID I haven't been able to see them in person I can't do a weight or height or check their growth I can still do a relatively full nutrition assessment on them with all those other parameters so sometimes I do question how much do we actually need to know their weight and their body shape size height etc BMI and will it actually change the interventions that we will do together it might be a bit different in pharmacy practice because it's very essential to medication dosing. I do think we're missing the mark though with BMI, but for the time being, there's a time and a place, but I always question whether it actually is that important if we're truly doing a full and holistic assessment. I, yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think probably for now, what I can kind of reconcile in my mind is that Probably we can continue to do what we're doing with the BMI for now until that better research is done. But I think we need to kind of just do a better job at explaining why. 
not just using this information that's discriminatory and that's like rooted in a discriminatory past. And like, you know, I just think that we probably now need to, to explain why. And I think that like, and I just didn't even know this until just recently about the discriminatory past and of BMI. So I think probably, I guess we're just getting woke when it comes to like, like health at every size now. Absolutely. And I think that's the first step is the recognition of the drawbacks and the history. And I think that's one of the reasons why sort of our racial awakening has had an impact on all these other sort of social movements that we're seeing um, take foot is that we're really questioning, well, why are we doing things the way that we're currently doing them? And what's the history behind that? So I think it's great that you've learned that, Danielle. I think that's, that gives me a lot of hope. Um, people can find this information out. You know, you just got to dig and ask why. Um, and I would say if your healthcare provider doesn't know where BMI came from, maybe you can help teach them. You know, maybe you can be the person because you listen to this awesome podcast called Health Animated that you now know what BMI is coming from and, and the drawbacks and you can discuss with them. So I think we want to empower people to recognize the drawbacks and then be aware of why it might be used. But then again, you know, advocate for themselves and, and as healthcare providers, recognize that there's a lot of other parameters that we can look to as well as their weight or BMI or body shape. Wow, this is a lot to uh, unpack. And I'm, and I'm glad we're, we're doing this right now, having this conversation. I just want to like pick up on this concept called health at every size, because I think it was something that you know, we had introduced at the beginning of the podcast. And I think throughout this episode, we've been kind of alluding to it. So this concept of health at every size. So we kind of, I mean, Dan and I, we did a little bit of research just to kind of wrap our heads around this concept. So our understanding of health at every size is that there simply isn't enough evidence to suggest that obesity or fatness is truly the root of many problems and that perhaps we really need to take a more evidence-based and patient-centered approach when it comes to our individual bodies. So Gordon, um, do you have any comments about that? Yeah, absolutely. So what I'll start off with is HAES, or H-A-E-S, health at every size, is actually a trademarked term. And so I use it very loosely because I, t I technically have not done the training myself yet. Um, and it's a... Um, it's a set of, of understandings. So I will explain it for your, for your audience to understand a bit better. So in my, my own words, haze or health at every size is a paradigm of thinking about healthcare and society, which eliminates the centrism around weight as the determinant or indicator of health. So what that means in a little more simple language is that despite your body shape or size, you should look at someone's health holistically from all the different parameters. And it also, Hayes also rejects weight stigma and bias so that people who are in larger bodies or have more fat should get the same level of care, health care and health access as someone who's in a thinner or smaller body. They shouldn't be discriminated against based on their body size alone. The big confusion and, and sometimes misunderstanding with Hayes is that people think that it means that everyone's healthy and that regardless of what body shape or size they are, they're healthy, which is not necessarily the case. What Hayes is saying more so is that it's not the cause of the health problems. It might be correlated to that, and we know that from a lot of health studies. People in larger bodies are more likely to have blood sugar problems and type 2 diabetes, more likely to have blood pressure problems, more depressed. Um, but we also know from a lot of other studies that they also face a lot more discrimination and lack of healthcare access and services and you know, aren't treated fairly or equitably. So who's to say that, you know, the discrimination isn't what's causing or poverty isn't what's causing the weight concerns. So Hayes is, is more so just removing weight as being the cause and yeah, just looking more holistically and then trying to refute the bias that people have in the implicit 
that's implicit to people when they think about um, people in larger bodies. So I hope that sort of clarifies what health at every size is. I think your explanation really resonates with me because it, it it's sort of it's sort of been like a theme that we've been we've been talking about throughout this entire episode where it puts the focus on looking at the individual holistically and i really appreciate your comment about you know looking at socioeconomic status looking at um perhaps someone's occupation um other other parameters like are they marginalized how many degrees of marginalization like those are all factors so at what point does the conversation kind of switch from having just extra weight to a disease itself? So like, is obesity a disease if you had to frame it in a different way? Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, because when I think about, um, you know, I hate to keep referring back to a pharmacy education, but I distinctly remember defining obesity as a medical condition and writing a care plan on obesity and you hear about a lot about the obesity epidemic exactly so so there's a lot of association with that word with disease so i guess can you shed a little bit more light on that and and again sort of where is sort of that inflection or tipping point where it goes from just the conversation about extra weight to a disease that's more of a concern Hmm. Or can we even call it a disease? Yeah. yeah. And we're all we're open to conversation here. Yeah. <laughs> this is a very spicy question. And the re <laughs> and the reason I say that is because there's a lot of controversy right now um in the in the health and wellness space, especially as it pertains to and I'm gonna say this in quotations, obesity care. So um, the first thing I'll say is, um, I, I want to apologize actually, cause I, I used the word obesity earlier in the podcast and I didn't, um, give a trigger warning, um, to your listeners. Um, the reason we, we sometimes, um, the reason I like to give a trigger warning when I, before I use the term obesity is because it can be quite harmful for some people when they actually hear that term. You might be wondering, well, how is that medical term traumatizing or harmful to people? Well, um, it sort of relates to everything else we've talked about in the podcast, the discrimination that's involved with people in larger bodies. And in fact, the word obesity itself, it can be quite harmful and stigmatizing. I don't know if you actually know the origins of that word, but obesity comes from the Latin term for eaten oneself fat, which is quite, quite stigmatizing, quite discriminatory. And Uh, very blaming and judgmental and we know that people in larger bodies might be that way for a multitude of reasons not just because they ate too much or didn't move enough Um, and contrary to a lot of influencers out there it's not as simple as calories in and calories out so it's not obesity and obesity care is very controversial right now because many people in the weight inclusive space and fat activism are questioning whether obesity should be considered a chronic disease or not so i'm i'm going to stay as neutral as possible and then basically discuss why i think they have termed it a chronic disease so on one hand there's a lot of physiological changes for people who are of bigger body size there's you know higher blood pressure for example there's more adiposity and Um, hormone changes for example so the endocrine system has some effects uh, as some examples okay Um, there's more pressure on their joints for example so some you know surgeons refuse to operate on like hip replacement or knee replacement because of their patients being too um, quote-unquote too obese or too overweight Um, the flip side to that is that well what's the problem here because if, if you're saying that, for example, their joints are not mobile, is it because they're actually sedentary and they're not actually doing physical activity? So therefore, they're not strengthening their muscles and ligaments around that, those joints so that they can mobilize them and build them stronger as they continue to use them because they've actually just been sedentary. Um, so it, again, it just sort of questions, well, what's the root of the problem that you're actually looking at and are, what are we missing? Um, some people are actually are proponents of the term obesity as a chronic disease because they think it actually removes the stigma 
from people who are fat because then well it's a chronic disease i don't control it similar to like diabetes you know i didn't control it i was genetically predisposed and a lot of environmental factors contributed to it but you know i didn't have full control over it so for some people it actually takes away the pressure for them um and then there's people on the complete opposite side too who think that it's stigmatizing because then um you're you're labeling me with a chronic disease when this is just how my body is this is just how it is this is how i look and the problems that you're identifying there's other reasons for them so it's quite the battlefield out there right now and um very very spicy uh dietitians don't even agree in fact there was a recent clinical practice guideline released by obesity canada and they asked for endorsement by dietitians of canada uh, the national associations of dietitians and they put a call out to all the members and dietitians in the community and they actually did not agree on whether they should endorse or not endorse the clinical practice guidelines. So there was less than 50% of support for the CPGs. And so Dietitians of Canada actually could not endorse it because not the majority of their members supported it. So that just happened last month. Very controversial and very spicy. So if you want to learn more, it's, it's lots of drama. Definitely. Who knew that in the dietetics world there'd be so much drama? <laughs> wow, that was um, that was very eye opening for us because again, this is me being naive. Uh, I I certainly thought it was a very a very simple question, and I was expecting a very simple response. But what I'm what we're hearing is that it is an ongoing debate, and even within um, the dietetics world, it sounds like people are quite divided mm -hmm. and so I guess the bottom line is we will just have to wait and see to kind of see where where this um, idea takes us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I think it'll be interesting too to see because if the Hayes um, movement philosophy yeah both words work if the Hayes like movement kind of is where we're heading which I don't know it sounds like it potentially could be how will that kind of interplay as well, right? Because those two things may be at odds with one another as well. So, wow. Absolutely. The, the drama, the spiciness. More spice to come. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of just change gears and pivot a little bit and think about the future. So, like, what advice, because I think a lot of the conversation today that we've had has centered around a lot of the problematic things that we've experienced growing up and like all of the kind of, you know, pervasive like messaging about like what is the ideal body. So what kind of advice do you have for like young parents, soon to be parents, teachers, people that are working with young people on like how to instill like healthy values and like how to normalize and celebrate different body types? And also to how to encourage kids to build a positive relationship with food at an early age, because I think that's important as well. Wow! So at the last minute of the podcast, you're gonna you're gonna ask these bomb questions, hey? I think this is honestly these are great questions, and they're they're really worth their own podcast episode. So guess what? We'll bring you back. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what we're trying to absolutely. Say. <laughs> so I mean, my simple, quick answer would be that it really has to do with the parents educating themselves so that they feel equipped with the right language and actions that they can do to support their children and then introducing their children early on to diversity in body size just like they would and should for race diversity and gender diversity or sexual orientation for example so just as I would encourage parents to start those conversations and set examples early on with their children they should talk about um, body diversity and and decenter negative talk about body size and weight to their children um, to really yeah build that home that's safe and weight inclusive so it's not uh, they that the children can grow up feeling positive about their bodies but yeah that's that's my quick and quick answer that was a very good quick answer and we'll we'll have you back for the the long one later <laughs> <laughs> Mark, mark your calendar, Gordon. <laughs> well, wow, like I personally, I just want to keep learning more and more and more about this topic. But obviously, all good things have to come to an end. 
So in typical fashion, we generally like to end our podcast with a, a silly question. Um, and so I hope you don't mind this silly question. So with all this talk about diet and normalizing conversations, um, I think it is very fitting to ask this uh, fun or silly question. So here it goes. What is your favorite junk food? A uh, very interesting question, Alex. So I think I understand what you're trying to get at. So I'll answer your question with what I think you want the answer type of answer to be, which is chips. I love chips, and that's something that I like to to really enjoy. But my question to you would be, well, what do you consider junk food? And why are we discussing food as being junk or not junk? That would be sort of something to ponder, and I would leave you with that. Typical Gordon answering my question with a question. That's why I love you so much. Um, but but you are right. Like I think again, like this was the vocabulary that we were raised with, and um, I will definitely do some personal reflection to ask myself why do I call it junk food? Because like you said, it has a negative. I mean, from what it sounds like you're trying to say is that there is a negative connotation associated with the word junk food. So, so thank you for that. So, just to probe a little bit deeper, is there a specific brand or flavor of chips you endorse? Oh. <laughs> okay. Ooh, okay, maybe not endorse, but okay. like, we're gonna get yeah, right. we're we're gonna we're gonna yeah. we're gonna dig deep and look at your credentials and what your <laughs> biases or hidden agenda. Is. So I have no financial disclosures to disclose. Yeah. Um, my favorite, absolute favorite chip is the honey Dijon flavor of Kettle Brand chips. I adore that. And every time it's on sale, watch out. <laughs> well, we'll have to add that to our snacks menu next time we have you on. Yes. Oh, noted. I appreciate that. <laughs> Great. Well, any last comments or thoughts before we um, say bye to our listeners? Yeah, I know. I, I just wanted to end off on a very positive note and say that I you know, really appreciate everyone listening to this episode and also acknowledge that it's a lot to take in and it might be kind of different, but there's a lot more conversation happening about it, which is really positive. But be kind to yourself and take your time when you learn about it because it's a lot of work and it's a lot of hard work. So yeah, just be gentle with yourself as you continue to learn if you're open to it. Oh my gosh, my heart just melted, Gordon. <laughs> you are such a pleasure to have on this podcast i just feel so enlightened and i think i learned so much and you're just such a warm person and it's been an absolute pleasure having you here thank you so much the pleasure has been all mine this conversation has been so uplifting and i almost feel energized from this conversation which probably isn't a good thing considering right now is 10 46 p.m guys so i hope you really appreciate this episode but all jokes aside we truly, truly, again, want to thank Gordon for really offering his time and expertise on such an important topic. Um, and, and we're also really hoping that in addition to learning something new about diet, that um, you also take a moment to just think about the, the dietitians as well who, who play such a key role in our healthcare system. I feel like sometimes... Um, like most allied health members that dietitians don't get enough credit so definitely if you've never worked with a dietitian before potentially this uh conversation could be um, a starting point for you so once again thank you gordon for joining our podcast and of course if you enjoyed this episode we really appreciate it if you can share this with your friends and family it would mean so much to us as well if you would give us a follow and don't forget to check us out on our various social media platforms by just typing at Health Animated. Thank you so much for tuning in and bye, bye for, for now. now.